welcome everybody for this second day of the workshop Mechanisms and Optic Causation in Life Sciences, the second workshop of the Nico Life Group. We have uh, the pleasure this morning to have the first Caleb Hazelwood, our first speaker, that, that will give us a talk entitled The Unbearable Lightness of Intervening or Realist Metaphysics of Manipulative Theories of Causation. So thank you very much, and thank you Alexandra and Charles for organizing. Really happy to be here. I've had a great couple of weeks at Le Van de Neuve. Um, so, uh, I'll begin by just saying that this is a, a collaboration with Yasmin Haddad, um, and it's, a, it's an especially fun one because um, it's a bespoke paper for this conference. Uh, we were really uh, interested in the, in the call for uh, submission, so I just bring all of our attention to it to remind us, to remind us of it. But, um, so the premise here, right, is that uh, interventionism as a theory of causation is ontologically thin or ontologically light, or I'm going to be using metaphysically light, ontologically thin. I'm going to be using these terms interchangeably, so if anybody wants to quibble about the nuances between them, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so um, so uh, just understand that I mean the same thing. Um, but, uh, so a lot of uh, sort of heavy-duty metaphysicians have complaints about um, the theory of uh, causation called interventionism or some, under some other manipulationist banner on the grounds that it's just strictly methodological. We'll talk about this more. Um, but a lot of causal, a lot of causal talk in, in the sciences and the philosophy of sciences especially has this heavier causal language. And so uh, we wanted to ask, well, what does happen if we were to take seriously this more metaphysically heavy language um, in the context of interventionism? So today, first, I'm going to talk about interventionism um, and its metaphysical lightness. And this should be you know, pretty familiar stuff to everybody. Um, and then I'm going to introduce what, word, what Woodward, James Woodward, calls his modest realism. And then I'm going to talk about Hassock Cheng's recent and uh, comparatively immodest realism. Uh, that's um, my uh, tongue-in-cheek term for it, not his. Uh, and then I'll show by putting these two together, some interesting <coughs> things fall out. And then I'll use a brief case study of downward causation uh, as an example of where we're going to get different verdicts um, in terms of the metaphysical robustness of the causal explanation. And the upshot that I'd like for you to take away here today is that uh, by combining Chang and Woodward, Woodward's interventionism and Chang's realism, uh, Yasmin and I get what we believe is, um, we, we get this metaphysically heavy language about causation while being able to maintain our commitment to scientific practice. And we think this is a good thing. Uh, we think that it's good to not uh, stray away from metaphysical language. Um, from realism language, and we think that Chang gives us um, a really nice uh, arsenal to do that, a really nice toolbox to do that. And I'll also say that, uh, just as a hat tip, um, what we're about to, what I'm about to talk about, dovetails very nicely with what Ray Lynn and, and what Jonathan talked about yesterday. I think these two frameworks are very compatible. Um, so first, uh, a brief recapitulation of interventionism. It's a theory of causation establishing that causal relations can be exploited for manipulation and control. Now, a key feature of interventionism is that cause and effect can be represented by variables. This is a stipulation for Woodward. This has to happen. You've got to be able to represent the causal variable, uh, the cause and effect, the causal relata as variables. And according to Woodward in uh, Making Things Happen, um, we say that x causes why, if a change or manipulation in X causes or triggers, or I like to say wiggles, a change in the value of Y, where X and Y are <coughs> properties that can be represented by variables. This is, of course, like a, you know, a behemoth of a book distilled into one sentence, um, but this is the gist. There are all kinds of qualifying things that have to be taken into consideration when you start talking about uh, independent fixability and uh, invariance and stability and proportionality, but we don't need to get into all of that. Um, 
the key is just to note that uh, interventionism helps us sort of pick out causal relations by representing the causal relata as variables and seeing if there are corresponding wiggles um, between those variables. Now, by contrast, most accounts of causation, the ones that, we've, uh, that, we, that we know from our philosophy of science courses, like uh, uh, David Lewis's, for instance, um, or, um, or, or, or any other sort of metaphysically heavier uh, accounts of causation, take them <laughs> to be distinct entities or events. Um, and on, on those accounts, uh, it's not just a, a matter of finding the causal relationships, right? It's a matter of being able to explain their nature, being able to determine the ontology, the, the, the true nature of causal relationships, and what all causal relationships have in common. What is it that makes it a causal relationship versus something else? And so critics uh, of interventionism who adopt these kind of metaphysically richer accounts of causation or, or, or aspire to, to, um, to provide one often state that it is metaphysically or ontologically light because it's an epistemic solution to the problem, right? It does not provide this ontology of causes that we're looking for. It does not give us a, a picture of the way the world really is. It shows us when causal relationships are happening, but it doesn't show us what's really going on. We don't get to look under the hood, so to speak. Um, good. And Woodward, you know, is okay with this. He argues for the methodological strength of interventionism. And he thinks that the methodological project is in and of itself valuable. He says that interventionism does not need to be tangled up in the metaphysics of causes to be worthy of being pursued. You can already see uh, the sort of flavor of his strategy, of his, of his response here. Um, he's willing to sort of sidestep metaphysics altogether. Uh, so he said in, um, in, in a recent paper that this is admittedly a thin notion of causation, both metaphysically or otherwise. I love this. He says, for x to cause y, it is not required that there be a continuous process running from x to y, that x transmit energy or biff or oomph or anything similar, nor is it required that x and y are variables that occur in some fundamental theory drawn from physics. These are often the kinds of things that those metaphysically richer adherents are looking for. Um, and then in his entry on manipulability theories of causation in the Stanford Encyclopedia, he says, one complaint is that if a counterfactual is true, it must be virtu uh, true in virtue of some truth maker, right? Counterfactuals can't just be uh, brute facts. They can't just be barely true, right? They've got to be true in virtue of something. And if they are true in virtue of something, something like laws of nature and possible worlds and initial conditions uh, or, 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 or marked transmissions or causal processes in the salmon sense or whatever, if they're true in virtue of some metaphysically richer thing, then we can, we can eliminate <coughs> interventions, right? Interventions help us epistemically find the thing to be explained by that metaphysically richer vocabulary, but he says appealing to interventionist counterfactuals is ultimately not necessary on this view once we take the account of these truth conditions seriously. Now his reply is to advocate for a kind of modest realism, but this modest realism has taken different shapes over the past few years, and it's interesting to see uh, how it has evolved. So at times he's offered um, this sort of modest realism where he says that it's the assumption that the difference between those relations that are mere, merely correlational and those that are causal has its source out there in the world. So in his more optimistic moments, Woodward is, um, is thinking, well, you know, I, these causal relationships do exist out there in the world, and maybe interventionism can't explain whatever is, you know, deeply metaphysical about them, but it can pick out bona fide causal relationships and distinguish them from non-causal relationships. But more recently, he's been rather pessimistic, uh, rather uh, cynical about uh, metaphysics altogether. And in 2017, in a chapter where he, um, he engages in a dialogue with a fictional doc uh, professor metaphysico, 
He says to Professor Metaphysico, I think it is worthwhile to do things that are of merely pragmatic interest. Philosophers such as Judea Pearl aren't trying to make contributions to metaphysics, capital M note. They are trying to do something else, and similarly for me, you can do metaphysics and I'll do what interests me. And it goes on, it's a very entertaining dialogue. Um, and uh, you know, so Professor Metaphysico is meant to be a caricature of an analytic metaphysician at a, at a, at a well-ranked uh, philosophy department. Uh, and, and Woodward um, um, is, not, is not shy about um, you know, uh, communicating his, his feelings about this kind of philosophy. So our question, Yasmin, and my question is, OK, well, you know, Woodward at times seems to sort of um, be OK with a sort of like scientific realism where the reason interventionism works is because it's tracking something real. Other times, he just seems to sidestep and eschew metaphysics altogether. So we want to know, is there a heavier or thicker account of metaphysics available for interventionism? Is there a way that we can sort of marry this practice uh, this commitment to practice that interventionism has, but also outfit it with a theory of metaphysics that allows us to say, yes, it is metaphysically robust, yes, it is metaphysically rich, yes, it is real, we need not shy away from that kind of language. It's not just the, the Louisians and the, um, you know, and, and the sort of analytic metaphysicians who, who get this, this real estate. And that's why I turn to Chang's um, immodest realism compared to um, um, Woodward's modest realism. And I say immodest um, with nothing but admiration and respect uh, for what he's done in this book, Realism for Realistic People. So in this recent monograph, in short, he defends an unflinchingly pragmatic account of realism. Uh, and for, for Chang, a concept picks out something real if the concept is central to the success of what he calls an operationally coherent activity or operationally coherent practice. Well, of course, we've got to define what is an operationally coherent practice. And he says it's a hermeneutical notion concerning a pragmatic kind of understanding, an understanding of how to do something. What is operationally coherent is what makes sense for us to do. And sense here is framed by our aims. Um, that's, to me at least, when I first read it, a bit of a head scratcher. But you go, th you, you, you read through some of his examples, um, specifically his examples about uh, phlogiston and caloric, right? And we start to get a sense of what he's doing. So uh, here's a simple example of operational coherence. Imagine that I want to determine whether putting the block of ice that I have over the fire is followed by the block of ice melting into water. I'm going to avoid using causal relationships here because, of course, that's what's at issue. So all I want to know is if I put this block of ice over that fire, will the block of ice melt? If I want to determine whether this correlation exists, it does make sense, given my aims, for me to take the block of ice and put it over the fire. But it does not make sense for me to take the block of ice and put it over another block of ice, right? given what it is that I want to know. So this former practice, putting it over the fire, is operationally coherent. It, it makes sense, given my epistemic aim to do what I'm doing. Whereas putting it over the block of ice, putting one block of ice on another block of ice does not make sense. It's operationally incoherent. If my target, uh, if my epistemic aim is figuring out if this correlation exists. Right, so operational coherence just means that, you know, if I want to figure out um, whether X does something, then it doesn't make sense to do anything other than X. That, that practice would be operationally incoherent, given my epistemic aim. OK, now obviously that opens up a lot of doors for things that can be operationally coherent. And that's a bullet that Chang's willing to bite. Um, and we can talk about that later if you'd like. Um, but then, uh, of course, the question at hand is, what does any of this have to do with realism? right? And Chang's going to say, well, realism for realistic people means that recognizing the entities, concepts, and processes that are central to these epistemic activities as real. So in this case, we ought not, doubt, ought not to doubt the reality of the block of ice, the fire, or the act of placing the block of ice over the fire, or, spoiler alert here, the ensuing correlation that occurs uh, when the block 
goes through a phase change over the fire. But of course, the interlocutor asks, well, yes, fine, but why should we call these entities or processes real? Um, you might say, well, look, the, the block of ice appears as such to me. It appears real, but is it really a block of ice? Or is it really something else, such as a collection of subatomic particles arranged block of ice-wise, right? Um, and this, is, this, this already starts to uh, reflect the kind of dialectic that you see Woodward engaging in, right? Because it's the kind, it's, um, you can imagine just replacing block of ice with cause and subatomic particles with you know, sort of laws of nature, right? Is it really a causal relationship or does it just appear to me as a causal relationship? Shang's answer is unequivocal. Yes, the entity picked out by our concepts really is a block of ice. It may also be an arrangement of chemicals and elements and subatomic particles, among other things, but it is also a bona fide block of ice, right? He's going to be very pluralistic about this. Why? Well, because we experience it as a block of ice. It's featuring in our, in our operationally coherent practice as a block of ice. And here he invokes William James, right? So he's being, again, unflinchingly unflinching pragmatist. He says, the source, of, the source of truth is experience, and it's futile to entertain any more grandiose notion. Um, his, his, uh, his metaphysics here is a complete and relentless empiricism. Empiricism recognizes experience as the ultimate source of learning and refuses to acknowledge any higher epistemic authority. Very grand sentence. Well, <laughs> that's all well and good, the interlocutor may say. But our experience is deeply informed by the concepts that we impose on that very world that we experience, right? So my experience of the block of ice melting over the fire is very much contingent upon the concepts that I, an embodied conscious agent, have constructed or inherited. And there is no reason to expect that my concepts should track the mind-independent noumenal world, right? Um, again, uh, Alexander made the, the point yesterday that it's fun to watch philosophy of science, just sort of, uh, I'll be, you know, put, put notes to come out in there as well. Um, and that's how Chang does embrace that. He, he, you know, sort of aligns himself with the, with the Kantians here in um, talking about transcendental idealism. Um, but right, so this is the kind of objection you might get from the analytic metaphysician to somebody like Woodward, right? Yeah, okay, uh, interventionism shows us what look to be causal relationships, but are we really, are, is this really tracking what's going on under the hood? Is it tracking what's, what's the, the sort of deeper metaphysical explanation? Chang's not worried about this though. He writes that operational coherence is the anchor of the kind of realism that pragmatists and empiricists in general can embrace. So this I think is a very smart move. Um, and I think it, it, uh, it distinguishes him from, from other um, it distinguishes him from other accounts that just sort of stipulate, well, look, we ought to just be realists. We should say that's real, right? And then we sort of get into a back and forth about what is real or what isn't real. Um, he sort of uh, throws down the gauntlet and says, look, any other kind of realism, one that is not grounded in our experiences and practices, is intractable. It's unavailable for scientists and philosophers who aspire to learn truths about the world they inhabit. And so he's here suggesting, he's here making a semantic move. He means to, it's kind of an ameliorative project, but not an ameliorative, pro, ameliorative project for sort of the, the lay folk. It's an ameliorative project for philosophers. He wants to improve our use of the concept realism. And he says, uh, you know, he's, pr he's proposing a change in what we mean by the very word real. He's not proposing operational coherence just as an indication of metaphysical reality, right, in the way that many scientific realists, realist arguments often work, like the no miracles argument, for instance. Rather, he says, it's about what we mean by something being real. And he suggests there isn't anything else that being real means in an operational sense. It just means these concepts are central to our operationally coherent practices. So a concept picks out something real. The concept is necessary for the success of some aim-oriented, operationally coherent practice. 
he immediately, of course, has to, to bite the bullet that uh, reality will come in degrees, right? Because the more operationally coherent practices that feature entity X, the more real entity X is going to be. And this allows me to make sense of my demarcating intuitions to say things like, okay, fine, Hassock, you know, black bile might be real, but surely, like, hemoglobin is more real, right? Um, and he's going to say, yeah, that's right. Well, why, why are we permitted to say this? It's because concepts such as black bile were at one time central to operationally coherent practices that have been superseded by practices that rely on concepts such as hemoglobin. And it makes sense to talk, for us to talk about hemoglobin, it makes more sense for us to talk about hemoglobin than it does to talk about black bile given our aims. And therefore, we ought to see hemoglobin as a better, more practical, and therefore more real way of carving up the world. It doesn't mean, of course, that the grand march of scientific progress is going to relegate black bile to the netherworld of pseudoscientific fictions, right? Where we say, okay, well, now we've got it. Now we've got the right picture. They were wrong. Thank you for your services, but, but now we've got the right picture of the metaphysical world. On Cheng's account, when Galen drew blood into a vial and observed it stratifying into four different columns, it really was the case that the darkest, densest column at the bottom was black bile. Um, but something being really the case is not a binary predicate in Cheng's hand. It's really the case that Galen's dark column was black bile, and it's even more really the case that Galen's dark column is the sedimentation of red blood cells. Right? So, of course, the metaphysician has a worry here. And it's that um, this is prima facie incompatible with one's belief that science and philosophy are oriented toward the truth. How can it be? And we be pluralists about this and say Galen was right about black bile, but my, med my, my, med <laughs> my physician is right about red blood cells. Is Cheng really arguing for such a radical constructivist picture of reality? One wherein we are able to legislate how the world is. And has he diluted the concept of what is real such that it is now just, it just hangs on nothing more than humankind's classificatory whims? Well, at this point it's helpful to introduce his distinction, I think a very helpful distinction between mind framing and mind control. So mind control refers to the phenomenon that plays a role in the plot of scientific uh, science fiction and fantasy novels. It's the ability of uh, the, the ability to control what happens in the external world with one's mind. So, for instance, here's Hassock Chang controlling a cheeseburger with his mind. Um, that would be really pretty cool. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not what he means. Uh, this is not what our scientific concepts do. Um, not even those who are vindicating, such as Galen's black bile, of course. Our scientific concepts are mind controlled but not, uh, rather, are not mind controlled, so I'm sorry, but mind framed. And mind framing refers to the way that we observe, experience, and describe, and categorize reference that exists out there in the world. And so black bile is mind framed, but not mind controlled, right? The concept picks out something real to an extent because it tracks an observable entity with certain properties that behaves, again, to an extent according to some theoretical framework. But the good behavior of this concept eventually is going to break down. And we can't control that. We cannot will it to afford us better predictions of infection and disease than it actually does. <coughs> the constraints of the concept are imposed by the world, not the observer. And as such, it is surely inevitable that other concepts will come along, concepts such as those that are central to the germ theory of disease. And those concepts, those new concepts, are going to bring along with them a suite of operationally coherent practices <coughs> that afford us better explanations and predictive power. Um, just uh, noting that I, I, I've said before that um, that nature can push back, I like this, this metaphor, nature can push back on a concept and render it unsuccessful. Um, and to look, for, um, a, to look for a phenomena that, that, aren't, that aren't understood through this kind of co-constructed, co-constrained relationship between the researcher and nature really ignores the undeniable role that scientists play 
in the features that they choose to emphasize, in the way they frame their concepts. Um, and so, you know, this, is, this came up yesterday. Okay, great, but, but why, don't, why don't we just call this instrumentalism constructivism? Um, you know, maybe I ought to just uh, admit that, that people like myself and Chang are, are in the business of engineering concepts that do a better job of helping us navigate the world, but, but they're, not, they're not helping us, um, you know, gain purchase on, on the mind-independent structure. Um, and I think helpfully here, Chang just looks back to Goodman and says, uh, you know, it's true that our concepts are not asymptotically approaching the mind independent of the world, but that by no means entails they're merely fictions. I think a great way of putting it is that for him, realism for realistic people is as real as it gets. And we, we make the world, we make versions of the world through our experience. Our experience is our epistemic touch point to what there really is. And there will be no access to the world unmediated by experience. And therefore, as far as a naturalized philosophy should be concerned, there can be no reality beyond that which we can observe or interact with and talk about. So briefly, as I promised a case study, to apply this to uh, interventionism, if you, take those, if you take those morals, right, this, these morals of um, sort of a radical empiricism about, about reality, and you apply that to interventionism, well, it seems like it gives Woodward sort of metaphysically sturdy legs to stand on, um, because we get to say your uh, well, we get to say, for instance, that um, the ca the causal relationships that are picked out by interventionism are very important for operationally coherent practices, namely all of the experimental sciences, right? And it's interesting to see how different kinds of, different treatments of interventionism then will spit out different verdicts in cases such as downward causation. So this is a diagram from Jaguan Kim that we're all probably very familiar with, but the idea is um, at the <clears throat> lower level you have uh, physical events causing physical events, and at the higher level uh, potentially, question mark, mental events causing mental events. The double arrow is the supervenience relationship, and the question is, if there are genuine causal processes happening down here at the physical level, and we assume there are, then is it possible to say <coughs> that the mental event at time one causes an event at the physical level, the lower level at time two? Well, the metaphysical purist argues that this is in principle impossible, right? Why? Well, because the causal closure of the physical world and the absence of overdetermination in nature. These are a couple of principles that are often uh, thrown around um, in defense of this, this idea that you, there can be no downward causation. And the appearance of downward causation just reflects a weakness in our causal concepts. Um, but, uh, you know, um, given these two metaphysical principles, there can be no downward causation. And this resistance abounds in biology. So for example, Alex Rosenberg has written that downward causation is a commitment intolerable to developmental molecular biology. Um, now contrast that with a recent paper by um, Woodward, 2021, called Downward Causation Defended. Um, he uses several examples. Uh, the action potential being, being a favorite, but I, I want to talk about frequency-dependent fitness because I think this is just such a, a beautiful and, and frankly pretty clear example. But let's say I intervene on a population such that um, I make it overwhelmed with these red butterflies who are Batesian mimics. They are mimics of the butterflies in this little blue slice. Um, by doing that, I've given the uh, the butterfly a fitness W, okay? And then time passes, and because the population's been overwhelmed with mimics, the birds catch on pretty quick, and that's not good for the mimics. So they start to eat all the mimics, and then the actual um, unpalatable birds, uh, uh, butterflies, start to, um, start to dominate the population. Well, this is going to improve the fitness of the, mimic, the mimicking butterflies, right? Because now they're a bit safer. Now, doesn't it just make sense to say that, well, we wiggled, 
the variation in trade frequency here, and there's a corresponding wiggle in the individual's fitness at time two. According to Woodward, you've got this intervention at time one, corresponding wiggle at time two, and if what you're looking for are just these kinds of causal relationships, and on Chang's account, that's real, right? That is a metaphysically robust thing. There, there is downward causation. We can talk about that more, I just got the bomb. Um, but the idea, the idea here is uh, that you know, Chang's framework is gonna outfit interventionism, I think, with a set of metaphysically sturdy legs. Um, using interventionism to determine causal relationships is an operationally coherent practice if there ever was one. It's all over the sciences. Um, and this is what it means for something to cause something else in countless scientific frameworks. It's not because our concept of causation is mind controlled, but because it's mind framed. Thanks very much. Question, comments? Jonathan. Yeah, so this was very cool. Um, I have, I guess, a comment about, you know, the, the way that you kind of pitched this and packaged it as like a move from, you know, away from like a light metaphysics towards a heavy or immodest metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I hear like heavy or immodest, like I would apply those terms to, you know, maybe what like the hardcore scientific realist, like the traditional realist would present, or maybe like what a hardcore analytic metaphysician would present. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I kind of get why you apply these terms to Chang's position in a way, because if Chang is right, this is like the best that you can do, basically. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, anything beyond that that goes like the traditional scientific realist route or like the analytic metaphysician route, like you could call that heavy or immodest, but like he would say what they're trying to do is impossible. So like this is the best thing that you can do. But at the same time, I just feel like slightly weird about labeling his view like a, a heavy view or an immodest view. So, cool. Yeah. Great, yeah, thanks. No, I think that's, that intuition is, uh, I, I share it. And it's something that deserves um, some discussion in the paper version of this. Um, but it's kind of in, in the spirit of what Chang's trying to do, right? Which is like to retool the terms um, and, to, and to, to change the standards. And that feels, I just like, I like how provocative that move is, I guess. Um, and if you think about it, right? The man is saying that phlogiston is real, so there's something pretty metaphysically heavy about that if you if you spin it the other direction. So I think you're exactly right. I think just framing it that way re requires a little bit of, uh, of explanation for the choice. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. This was really interesting. Um, I. So I think a problem uh, with Chang's view, I think there is a problem with Chang's view, if it means that we can't say, oh look, we got it wrong. This thing that we thought existed actually doesn't. And this other thing exists. Um, saying that we always get it right to some extent. <coughs> As in, there really is no such thing as black bile. And there really is no such thing as black bile. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. Um, right. So, I think what he wants to do, right, is say that something like, uh, so, okay, there's really no such thing as black bile, but is there really such a thing as red blood cells? Yeah. Right. So, that's our intuition we want to really say that's, that we want to, to hold on to that. Um, of course, the pessimistic meta-induction argument is imme immediately available. Um, but also, just to say that the kind of thing that we're doing with red blood cells is exactly the kind of thing that was being done with black bile. And we're doing it better because the concept is better. It, is, it, it does a better job for our practices. Um, but it's still a mind-framed concept. In the same way that black bile is a mind-framed concept. It's just framed in such a way 
that it, it, it affords us better predictions? The answer is yes. It's impossible to say that something does not exist completely. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. yeah. If, if, yeah. And, and you don't think that that is a problem? Well, you know... I mean, aren't many scientific advances about disproving the existence of things we previously thought existed? They, yes, but again, I think what's really interesting about this take is that it <laughs> emphasizes <laughs> the conceptual ladenness of anything we discover or disprove. So it, it is, I think it's what Chang is doing is noting the scientific hubris that is involved with saying, ah, well now we've got genes right. We didn't have them before, but now we've got them. Even the negative claim, so. Oh, now we know phlogiston does not exist. Yeah, and right. says, no, we don't. Yeah. But, but, yeah, but that's the project. That's the well, project. yeah, yeah, absolutely. His project is it's that. Yeah, no, I mean, he's intentionally being very pr provocative there. Um, but I think it is to elicit the, exactly the kind of uh, uncomfortable <laughs> intuition that you're feeling and say, well, yeah, it's because he wants to reject this idea that we can keep going along saying, oh, oh, we got it wrong the last, you know, however many times, but this time we've got it. It's just that th things are actually on this sort of empiricist spectrum, and we are getting better and better in terms of our ability to afford predictions. But if we survive as a species, then probably we'll have concepts some time from now that do even better and are more real than red blood cells, right? On chain's view. Well, I very much like the project, and, and you had me on board throughout the talk. Excellent. However, um, <laughs> the end... <laughs> always, always, a, always a however. <laughs> the end of the talk hit me completely unexpectedly, <laughs> which means that I would love to uh, continue listening to you mm -hmm. uh, for much longer. Okay, um, but So what it left me with, yep. uh, the unexpected ending, was sort of, well, now where is the metaphysics? I mean, obviously, you're saying something about the reality of, of yep. downward causation, yep. Yep. and I think that the, 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 uh, the argument is, 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 is very compelling and um, very, very interesting. I just wonder, um, is there going to be more metaphysics than just the claim that downward causation is real in that light sense you're, you're elaborating? Right. So in other words, is there, um, are you, um, you have any uh, further thoughts uh, that bring in um, well-known metaphysical categories, such event, yeah. such as event or process or yeah. or uh, possible world or whatever. Perfect. So, Perfect. Um, so is that already the end of the project? Uh, and the goal of the project was just to establish the reality of that yeah, organization perfect. and elaborate the, the exact sense, or is there more metaphysics to come? That's my question. Perfect. Thank you for that question. Um, and it's something we discussed in the paper. The beauty of Chang's uh, framework is the pluralism, right? So interventionism, interventionism and scientific endeavors are not the only operationally coherent practices. There are metaphysically operationally coherent practices. There are operationally coherent practices that metaphysical, the analytic metaphysicians use. Um, they don't apply as often or as reliably to experimental science, um, and as such, um, will not be in the scientist's toolkit. Something like possible worlds is not going to be in the scientist's toolkit as readily as something like interventionism will be. But um, events and possible worlds and all of these things are, 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 can feature in operationally coherent practices and therefore can also be on metaphysical par with interventionism. What I think what's great about um, this approach is that we get now the question is not about which metaphysical picture is real or not real, is, is metaphysically heavy or metaphysically light. The question is about what is relevant to your epistemic aim. Are you trying to just identify a causal relationship, in which case interventionism is going to be a perfect metaphysical solution? A causal relationship is that which is picked out by, by Woodward's methodology. Or are you trying to determine, say, a mechanism for it. In which case, if that's your explanatory target, then interventionism, it, it would be operationally incoherent to use interventionism to explain the mechanism, because interventionism isn't designed to do that, right? So we can have more metaphysics 
if we want a different explanatory scope. But those, those, the other metaphysics are not at the expense of interventionism, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Great. Kevin, a short question, short last question. Yeah, I wanted to uh, go back. Okay, thanks a lot, by the way. I will have the project and I will move on with it as well. I wanted to go back to the question of uh, patient tolerance and how you can go from here to the metaphysics. Because one of the witnesses in the book is uh, the, what he calls the witch card objection, but he, is quite, he goes quite too slowly on that. And he goes too quickly to say that uh, you should not. Uh, Put more uh, to put a raised weight on the pseudo scientific beliefs. Mm -hmm. But since he lacks uh, metrics to define how you should uh, convert from projects, that's kind of one of the weakness of the book. But there is no metric to compare what's more successful, mm -hmm. what's more successful professional practice. Mm -hmm. And the concept itself of operational coherence is too uh, weak to uh, allow a uh, uh, strong demarcation point, I think. So I, I wonder if you had some uh, insight on that, on how you should define the yeah, that's a great question. That's a really great question. Um, right. Um, I think too big a question for me to, to, to handle it. here. I would love to discuss it with you uh, later, but I think the first thing to say would just be You, you don't just want to do like absolute numbers, right? You don't just want to say, well, more scientists are using interventionism than philosophers are using mechanism. So, but I think one thing we can at least get away with saying is um, there should be no question, at least comparatively, that, that interventionism is so central in operationally coherent practices. Um, how to put them together, how to, to compare them, whether they could be put in commensurate, commensurate um, uh, measurements, I, I genuinely don't know, and I have to think about it a lot more. Yeah. Thanks. Let's thank again our speaker.